Examples of using the grading equation to solve problems. I'll read to you our first example. We have an 11 millimeter wide diffraction grating and its rulings have 550 lines per millimeter. So the question is, given that diffraction grating, what is the longest wavelength that forms an intensity maximum in the fifth order? So I didn't make up this example. I took this off the internet somewhere, I think off of Cura, and it's a rather poorly worded question, but it is very typical of how grading problems are worded. So I wanna step you through really how you would solve this. And what it's essentially asking is, what's the longest wavelength where there is a fifth order diffraction order? And given the definition of the grading, how do you solve this? So all of these problems start with the grading equation. And so the first thing I do is write the grading equation and then I go term by term and figure it out what it is I know about these terms given what was in the problem statement. And it will turn out that a lot of information isn't given and I wanna step you through the assumptions and why I'm making them. So the first, the refractive index where we are observing the diffraction. They didn't tell us in that problem whether it's the transmitted or reflected or, or somewhere else we're observing the diffraction. So whenever that happens, always assume it's the reflected modes that are, are being studied. That's typically how gradings are used anyway on the reflection side, not the transmitted side. That is certainly not always true, but if it's not stated, I think that's probably your best assumption. It also just defined the diffraction grading. It didn't mention what kind of material that diffraction grading is embedded in. So in that case, most diffraction gratings are sitting in air. So we will assume that our incident wave is coming in from air. We're looking at the reflected mode, so that is also in air. So to conclude, our observed and even our refractive index of the incident region, those are the same, uh, is 1.0. So right away we have two parameters, but we had to make a lot of assumptions just because it was poorly worded. Angle of incidence, that was also not given. And when that's not given, assume normal, um, or maybe try to clarify it. But here I'm gonna assume normal incidence. So theta ints is zero degrees, zero degrees off of the normal. Next thing, the grading period. We weren't directly given the grading period, but we know over the span of one millimeter, there's 550 lines. So one millimeter divided by 550 is about 1.82 microns. So that's the grading period. Grading slant. This also was not given. However, for a ruled grading, the slant angle is 90 degrees because those grooves are vertical. So without having that information, that's what we would have to assume. So we'll let that phi angle, the slant angle, be 90 degrees. The diffraction order index, that's M. Well, the question's asking, you know, what, what do things need to be? What's the longest wavelength that the fifth order diffracted mode is a real mode, is a propagating wave? So that says we need to set n equal to five in this equation. The free space wavelength, this is what it's asking for. So we need to figure out what's the biggest number we can put in for that free space wavelength such that our angle is a purely real number. And that's really the last thing, that angle. So we just need to make sure, that angle can be anything, but we need to make sure that the angle for the plus and minus fifth order modes is a purely real number. So that's the question. What's the biggest value of lambda such that we get a real number for theta? So we plug in the numbers we got from the previous slide. So we have our refractive index for the observation region is one, the refractive index in the incident region is one, although this shouldn't even matter because sine of zero degrees or angle of incidence, this whole term will just go to zero. 
We put in five for our diffraction order number. Our grading period we calculated as a 1.82 microns and the slant angle is 90 degrees. So this sign will go to one. So our equation reduces to this. And now we have to ask the question, what is the biggest value for lambda naught that lets this theta for the fifth order diffracted mode be a real angle, a real number? So we start off with the equation in the last slide, and we're asking what wavelength ensures that theta, the angle of the fifth order diffraction order, is a purely real number? So what we need is the term on the right hand side to be less than or equal to one. When this is greater than one, that's when it doesn't make sense to calculate an inverse sine of that because that ends up with an imaginary angle. So we need that argument to be less than or equal to one. Now we can solve this inequality for the wavelength. And we see that as long as the free space wavelength is less than or equal to 364 nanometers, we will ensure that that fifth order diffracted mode exists. So the final answer is that longest wavelength is 364 nanometers. In summary for this example, I want to go through the three key assumptions that I see so often not specified in these grading problems that I always have to make. One is that the grading is an error. They rarely specify a refractive index. And I think that's a shame because that does change the answer. But if not specified, I, we have to do something and I think it's okay to assume error. Very often the angle of incidence is not specified. So I think it's okay to assume normal incidence, zero degrees. And very often they just talk about, you know, what's a condition of something so that there's a fifth order to diffracted mode, but they don't say whether that's transmitted or reflected. Well, most diffraction gratings are used on the reflection side. We, we bounce light off of them. So without, being, without it being specified, uh, assume the reflected diffraction orders are to be considered. So that's it for this example. Example number two. This is a good example because it involves counting the number of diffraction orders based on your configuration of diffraction. So I'll read this to you. Light with wavelength of 632 nanometers, so that's red light, it's incident at 30 degrees onto a diffraction grating that has 3,000 lines over one centimeter. Question is, how many diffraction orders will this grating produce? So now we actually have an angle of incidence to take into account. Let's see how this is solved. Like before, we start with the grading equation and we'll go one parameter at a time and figure out what numbers we can put in here based on the definition of the problem. Again, not enough information was given, so we have to make some assumptions. So we will assume that this is being used as a reflection grating and it's an error. That means both N observed and N incident will be 1.0. The angle of incidence, that was easy. It was given to be 30 degrees. And we know later on sine of 30 degrees is 0.5. So that'll be a handy, useful number. The grading period, we were told 3,000 lines over a distance of one centimeter. So one centimeter divided by 3,000 gives a grading period of around 3.33 micrometers. The grading slant wasn't given, but for ruled gratings, we can assume that that's 90 degrees. So sine of 90 degrees will go to one. The diffraction order, this is really what we're solving for. We're going to figure out what values of M give real valued angles so that we can figure out how many actual propagating waves we have for the diffraction orders. We're going to count those. The free space wavelength, that was given to be 632 nanometers, and that's about red light. Last, the angle of the diffraction orders, we're not necessarily going to solve for that, but we're going to count values of M 
that lead to real values of the angle as a diffraction order that is not cut off. Uh, any values of m that produce an angle that is an imaginary complex number is a cut off diffraction order. We will ignore that. So we put in all the numbers and we end up here. So we can simplify that down so that we have a simpler grading equation. And this is really what we'll work with now. So we're going to figure out in this new equation what values of m will give us angles that have a real value. We'll count all those values of m, and that's the number of diffraction orders. So we start with the equation from the previous slide. And in order to have this angle be real numbers, that means the argument on the right, the magnitude of that has to be less than or equal to one. So mathematically, this is the equation that we will solve. And as long as this is satisfied, any value of m that satisfies this will count as a diffraction order. So to do this analytically, I like to look at both positive and negative values of m separately. We have to look at them separately because we have an angle of incidence. Our diffraction is not symmetric. If we had normal incidence, this 0.5 would not be here. We'd have a symmetric problem. And so the limiting value of m on the positive side would be the same as the limiting value of m on the negative side. But we don't have that. We have an angle of incidence, asymmetric diffraction, and we have to check them separately. So first, let's check negative values of m. And look, what is the largest negative value of m that still satisfies that equation? So what I'll do is I'll just associate the negative with the m. So we end up having a positive out here. Then we solve that equation or the inequality for the value of negative m. And we see that negative m is less than 2.64. That tells us that our m value has to be greater than or equal to negative 2.64. Now our diffraction orders are discrete, and so we have to round this to an integer. Since m has to be greater than negative 2.64, that means that negative three is not an option. Negative three is less than negative 2.64. So when we round this, our answer really is that m has to be greater than or equal to negative two. So that's on the negative side. Now let's think about the positive side. So for positive values of m, let's go back to our inequality where we still have the, the positive here. As this becomes very large, suddenly the expression in here becomes negative. And that's okay, because we're taking the magnitude of that. But in order to find the limiting value, what we'll do is we will reverse the order of this subtraction, and that lets us drop the magnitude operation. Now we can figure out what positive value of m makes this less than negative one. So we solve that for m, and we can do the math. We need m on the positive side to be less than 7.91. Well, we can't have a fractional diffraction order. We need integers. So that means that 8 is not an option. Therefore, the highest positive number that m can assume is 7. So now we actually have two limiting values for m. We can bring these together, and we can see that m goes from minus 2 to positive 7. All of those will be diffraction orders from this grading. So how many diffraction orders we have? We might be tempted to say 7 minus, minus 2 gives us 9 diffraction orders, and that's actually not correct. We do say 7 minus negative 2, and that would give us 9 diffraction orders, but we have to add 1. And that's simply because subtracting these two numbers ignores the zero order diffraction order. And so this is that zero order. We have to add one to that. So the final answer is this diffraction grading would produce 10 diffraction orders.